Welcome to the Frugalpreneur Podcast. I'm your host, Sarah St. John, and my guest today has been designing her lifestyle from scratch for almost a decade. As the host of the Freedom Lifestyle Podcast, Sam interviews digital nomads, remote workers, freelancers, and entrepreneurs who pursued a career that provides freedom over their schedule, location, and finances. Welcome to the show, Sam La Liberty. La Liberty. <laughs> Yeah, I know. When I got married, everyone was like, are you going to take your husband's last name? And I'm just like, I can't. It's too good. It works so well with the freedom lifestyle, liberty, unique. So I'm keeping it. Another thing before we kind of dive in, I was noticing on your website that you have a teal theme or that's the color. And that's actually my favorite color. So really? I love it. Yeah, I love it. Oh. Three years ago now, I invested in my personal brand. When you're first starting for a girlfriendner, you do a lot yourself, playing around with Canva, playing around with, oh, I just kind of like this color. I think it could go with this color and got really far that way. And then about three years ago, I decided to really take my personal brand seriously. And one of the first things I did was upgrading my website and actually worked with someone who helped me decide what are the colors that represent your brand? And what are the fonts that represent what you stand by? And really being intentional about it. And so the jungle green, dark foresty vibes is what we're going with, which is very appropriate. I'm taking this from Costa Rica today. Awesome. I love that. So I know I gave kind of a little bit of your background, but can you help fill in the gaps? Like how did you get started on this journey? One revenue stream at a time. And that's a big message that I have for people who are just starting out. I coach a lot of clients who say, I want to have online courses and a coaching program and this ebook and do this e-commerce store and be a consultant and have a podcast and have a YouTube channel. And they have so many big ideas, which is amazing. That means you're entrepreneurial. It means you're ambitious. It means that, okay, you're investing your energy in the right place, doing your own thing. But the problem when we have too many ideas going on at once is you tend to not make progress on any of them. And so how I really feel like I was successful is I focus on one revenue stream at a time. So right now, if somebody asks me how I make money, I can start to see their eyes glaze over because it's taking me so long to answer the question of what do I do? So I'm like doing so many different things. But it really started modestly and with one revenue stream, which was freelance. How could I get a company to pay me flexibly to work from anywhere in the world? And that's what I started with. And how long ago was that? That was in 2017. So at that time, I was in an office job. This was way before remote work and the ability to work from places like Costa Rica, which is where I'm working from this month, became mainstream. And I had a boss who wouldn't even let me work from home, let alone work from San Francisco, which is where my boyfriend was living at the time. We were long distance. And so my journey actually starts with me pursuing freelance and pursuing the freedom lifestyle so that I can keep this relationship going. It was getting so expensive flying back and forth from Canada to the U.S. So back in 2017 is when I started and it was all just in the pursuit of love at the beginning. That's awesome. I know one of the things that you talk about are the three myths and mindsets that hold people back from pursuing freelancing and the gig economy. What are those? So the three myths, one is that there's not enough opportunities to go around, that freelance gig, contract-based work, it's just too amazing and too good to be true that there must not be enough opportunities, which is not true at all. Another myth is that I don't have enough experience or enough skills for anyone to hire me to actually do something flexibly as a freelancer. And then the last myth is that it's not stable, that leaving a nine to five steady paycheck is a much more secure path than going out and building a career as a freelancer. And so a big part of my message is helping people debunk these things and really see that this is actually, in my opinion, your safest and most secure route to becoming a self-employed entrepreneur and having that freedom over your schedule, your location, and your finances. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up the point about how people think that having like a nine to five is the safe way to go because I think we're conditioned or programmed or whatever to believe that. But you really don't have any control then because you could be laid off or fired or the company could shut down. I mean, numerous 
possibilities could go wrong. And so really the safe approach would be to at least, you know, start out maybe having your nine to five and then having like a side gig on the side, but build it up to where then that becomes your full income. Yeah, absolutely. At the beginning, you want to figure out a way to do this sustainably. But where I'm at right now with these multiple revenue streams, I have four core clients that I pay on retainer every single month. That pays all of my bills and more. And that allows me to really play and be creative with my own entrepreneurial products, my other revenue streams, the passive ways I want to make money, or my ideas for how I can make a real impact in the world. I have these clients that pay all of my bills every single month. They're companies, but I'm working on my own terms. I'm setting my rate. I'm deciding where I work from. I'm setting my own schedule and I'm pitching them on, hey, you want to work with me? Here are my terms. And what's great about that is if any one of them went away, I still have three others. And in the last seven or so years that I've been doing this, my freelance business has survived literally a pandemic where so many companies shut down, changed things up, got scared, their businesses ended overnight. And now it's also surviving a bit of a recession. We're not really clear what's going on with the economy right now, but we're having this other wave of people losing their jobs, of companies getting scared about growth, of revenue being reduced, and them having to reduce their workforce. And I have been so secure this entire time. I've absolutely lost a client or two here and there, but I felt so secure that I have other revenue streams to support me. I've watched my friends lose jobs in the last three years unexpectedly, and that is brutal. Out of nowhere, all of a sudden you're searching for a job. Hopefully you have some severance to pick yourself back up again, but when you're not prepared for it, it's just complete chaos, and that doesn't exist for me. I kind of feel like everyone who does have a full-time nine-to-five job, if there's something that they have an interest in or a hobby or something that they could teach someone or some kind of creative thing they can do, I feel like everybody should start a side hustle just as extra income for now, but to fall back on just in case, because you never know with the economy, pandemic, whatever. And even when things are going totally right in the world, you could still get laid off. So what all freelancing do you do? At the beginning, I had a very clear focus on what I was looking for. Anyone who would hire me to work from anywhere in the world. So at that time, my boyfriend at the time, now husband, who's back there, he's not allowed to come inside during the recording. He was working in the Uber head office in San Francisco, and he had a job. So he wasn't necessarily having the freedom lifestyle of being able to travel the world with me. But now I wanted to be able to come see him in San Francisco and be able to visit for a long period of time. And so anybody who would hire me to do anything from anywhere in the world, I was up for. And that allowed me to really experiment where I got a lot of information on what kind of work do I like to do? What pays well? What are the industries where my skills are really good fit for? And I really treated the first year as an experiment. So I did copywriting, social media management. I helped plan some events. I launched some influencers and affiliate marketing campaigns. I leaned on the skills that I had had in my nine to five, sales, marketing, communication, PR. And I realized there were so many different ways that I could apply those skills for contract work, for flexible freelance work. Now today, it's much more focused. I've really leaned on the world of podcasting and my expertise in this space. I've really leaned on my speaking and hosting skills and being able to host events and create experiences that are meaningful. And those are the core ways I generate income now. But at the beginning, anyone who will pay me to go visit my boyfriend for like a month, eventually he quits his job too, and then we start traveling together. But it really started modestly like that. Wow. So what tips would you have for someone who is picking up multiple freelance gigs and how to balance time? And maybe one gig has a a due date or something or like is more pressing than another but then you know I don't know juggling because I think when you have like a regular nine to five it's kind of like you have these certain set of tasks you have to do and you're only dealing usually with one boss usually but then when you're a freelancer you're dealing with multiple bosses and having to juggle and and figure out on your own what's the most important thing what do I need to get done first so do you have any tips on that being disciplined and being organized is a must 
it's a requirement. There's so many people who I talk to that are like, working from home just wasn't for me. I just need to be in an office around people who are working where I'm accountable to somebody or else I just spend the day lounging around, doing the dishes, watching Netflix. And I, I couldn't relate to that. I just thought that I'm so motivated to get what I need to get done so that I can close my laptop and go enjoy my life. I've always been really inspired and motivated by living a very full life, living a life that is full of lots of different experiences and having work support my dream life and my life coming first. So I think because I have that mindset, I'm very motivated to be efficient because I know as soon as I get this task done, I'm in Costa Rica, as I mentioned, I'm going to go play beach volleyball or I'm going to go to this yoga class and it's at a specific time or the sun's out, it's been raining for a few days, I'm going to go work on my tan. Whatever that is for you, wherever you are in the world, if you have a higher opportunity cost of what you could be doing instead, that's going to help you be a lot more productive and efficient. When you have to be in an office for 40 hours, it's like, well, there's no real motivation or incentive to get my work done quickly because I have to be here till five anyway. So I might as well just dilly dally around here and there, hang out at the water cooler, make another coffee, chit chat with a friend. And I think that that can actually create really bad habits of just spamming out work when it doesn't need to take that long. So when you're self-employed and you have that strong motivation, you're naturally going to get more efficient. That is what's happening from all of the freedom seekers that I interviewed. That is a common theme. How you can get started on getting better at that is definitely see yourself up for success each day. Every single night before bed, I can't grab it, it's too far away, but I have the productivity journal and it's from Intelligent Minds, the same people that make the five-minute journal. And every single night before bed, I put my tasks for the next day and I set reasonable tasks. Like there's a schedule of what happens. So today I had this interview with you at 11. I had a podcast coaching call this morning. This afternoon, I have a couple other calls and then I have beach volleyball at four o'clock. I put those things in and then I see where's my blank space to get work done. And I create tasks for myself based on what I can actually get done in that blank space. The worst thing you can do is say you're going to do a bunch of stuff and then realize you scheduled calls all day that you have to be focused in and you did nothing. And then you just feel bad about yourself and then you lose your confidence. You want to set yourself up for success by setting reasonable goals and you got to set them the day before. In terms of like what you should work on when, I think that's really up to you to think about what are your needle moving tasks. It's so easy to spend our entire day in our inbox and social media, on Slack, if you're using that. Any of these instant messaging tools are complete time sucks. And so you really want to think about, I do it on a weekly basis. What are the big things I need to get done this week based on my deadline? And those happen first. Every day I have a little task. It's called admin. It's little tasks. It's things that should take like five minutes. Post this on Instagram. Reply to this email. Select this caterer's menu options for an event I'm planning. These quick tasks, those all get done in a chunk period of time. But I do my meaningful things first that are typically related to bigger projects, require deep thinking. And so those are some of the habits that you can start to implement until you just naturally become more efficient because life's too good to be on your laptop all day. Yeah, I love that planner. I've never heard of that. So I will have to look that up and I'll put it in the show notes too, because I'm sure other people would want to check that out. And I think I hear a rooster. That's so awesome. I yeah, thought roosters sorry about were... that. Oh no, I like it. It adds to the whole vibe of Costa Rica and stuff, which by the way, it seems like a lot of people are vacationing in Costa Rica. Like that's the hot spot. And we were talking before we started recording about how you do have a property, but when you're traveling, you rent it out on Airbnb to help. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So as my journey progresses over the years, I mentioned my husband quits his job. We start traveling the world together. And now when you're two people that have the flexibility to work from anywhere, it feels like the sky is the limit. You are so excited about this newfound location freedom. You are trying to collect as many passport stamps as possible, as many new countries. Everyone's like 30 before 30, 30 countries before the age of 30, all of this stuff. And so it was really busy at the beginning, trying to go to all of these different places. And then we realized moving around so much is not that productive. When you have to get to a new city every couple of weeks, you're figuring out where's the grocery store. Okay, how does the internet work? 
Where am I going to do this? How does this town work? I also want to go enjoy it. So I'm much more in the like tourist mindset versus work mindset. So eventually we start to shift our work and travel lifestyle to more like slow matting, where you spend longer chunks of time in the same places throughout the year. And at this time, our businesses are both growing, we're doing well, and we're ready to invest in our first home. And right from the beginning, we knew that we didn't want to fall into that trap where if I buy a house and I have a mortgage and I have all these fancy things and I make it my dream home, well, then I'm going to want to be in my dream home all the time. And I'm spending so much on my mortgage, like there's no way I can go to Costa Rica for a month. So when we bought this property back in 2020, we teed it up from the very beginning with a mindset of this is going to fund our freedom. This isn't going to take away our freedom. So we furnished the place very quickly. We really thought about what would somebody who's an Airbnb type of renter need and look for. There's no photos of us around the house. It's not that vibe. And that allowed us to not be so attached to the space. So in a given year, I'll probably spend six months in my home. That's the maximum amount of time you can be away from Canada before you start to lose your health insurance and your social security and all those things. And then the other half of the year, we're often returning to places we love. So this is my fifth year in a row coming to Costa Rica, renting this exact little jungle home. And I'll be here for two months before heading home again and then head to Europe in the spring. So Costa Rica, you spend two months in and then where else do you travel? Well, you Mm -hmm. said Europe, but like where in Europe? So Costa Rica is the one trip I say that I always do for myself. I'm like, this is the place I want to go to. I have friends here now. I know how it works. It's my like dream life. My ideal way of living is here. But a big part of the way I make money, I mentioned, is creating these events and hosting different events. And so often what I'll, I'll have is I'll have probably four or five different international events that I'm scheduled to get and be part of in a year. And if it's a place I haven't been to, then I'll typically add time to that. So for example, I'm going to Greece in the spring. I haven't been to Greece before. So I'm going to add three weeks on after the event and stay there for about a month. In the fall, I have an event in Vietnam. And so again, I haven't been there before. So I'm going to, if I'm flying all the way over to Vietnam, I want to stay for ideally six weeks. That's my sweet spot. The more you stay, the better it gets for the most part. But that's how I'm kind of thinking about it now is where is someone paying me to travel to? Because then my flights are covered for Goldpreneur again and (laughs) extending my time there. If that ends, then I think it will honestly look like more time in Costa Rica. I just think there's something so special about returning to a place where you just feel like your best self. Versus the chaos that can often happen in exploring a new territory as as much as it's an adventure. So how do you go about getting these international speaking gigs? It's been a journey. I mentioned how I rebranded my website and did a big Mm -hmm. personal brand. That was about two or three years ago to get to this moment where I really wanted to add motivational speaking, speaking in general as a revenue stream. I felt like I'd learned so much in the last, at that time, five years that I now wanted to instead just interview people on my podcast. I really wanted to share my message. And so it's not an overnight success. It's challenging to become a motivational speaker and deliver workshops. But there are a couple of websites that I'm part of. Gig Salad is a great one where you can create a profile on there. It's people looking for speakers. There's also The Bash. That's another one. And I found a bit of a niche in helping companies who are doing a team retreat and team event. And then I come in and I'll lead different sessions for the company. So different team building or even emceeing the experience. I often get paid to just do emceeing and hosting. So that's how I do it with companies. And then myself, it's a lot of just pitching myself for opportunities to speak. And while we're kind of on that topic, another thing that you talk about is the art of self-promotion and marketing yourself to a global audience which maybe you've kind of covered that a little bit, but can you go more into that? Yeah, that is one of my signature talks, actually, that I shop around. So when you want to become a speaker, you really want to think about, okay, what are my core topics? What is my message? And is this a workshop or is this a keynote address? So my keynote addresses are big picture thinking. This, how can you use flexible work to create your dream life, right? That's my like big idea, I would say. 
and really having life and business come together and using work as a way to just enable how you want to have every day look like. I think that's like my big keynote address message. But then I also sell these smaller workshops where it's like, let's get into the weeds of what this looks like. So the art of self-promotion, I actually delivered this workshop yesterday to a group of about 100 entrepreneurs in Chicago through an organization called SCORE. And in this talk, yes, I definitely give cutting edge marketing tools and how we can use modern technologies like AI and podcasting to build our brand. But there's a big part of it, which is all around how do you even get comfortable with self-promotion? How do you even move past that ickiness that comes up for so many people of really like putting yourself out there, being available for judgment, potentially being vulnerable, moving past the concern of what people can think. And so if you're on this journey and you think like, okay, self-promotion is a word that feels really icky for me, you have to do that mindset work first. Because even if you know all the skills, if I tell you right now, 10 different ways to grow your audience or to position yourself as an expert, that's cool. But if you're going to be so in your head about what this guy from high school who's following you on Instagram, who was like a bully that's still following you 10 years later, what he's going to think, you're never going to do it. And so a big piece of it is working on your mindset, taking up space online and focusing what can go right, not what could go wrong in these scenarios. Yeah. And you've also partnered with WeWork and Fiverr. What does that entail? Or, or I guess when you say partnership, like what have you done with them and, and how would you go about if someone is looking to partner with a company, what that process would be like? Really, it's about creating your dream list first. So if you have some type of audience or some type of community you're creating or even just an idea for what a partnership could look like, you've got to think about, OK, well, what are the brands who this message, this audience would align with? And for me, Fiverr and WeWork at the time, WeWork not so much now, but when I was starting, WeWork was the perfect partner for me. Fiverr still is. They still sponsor my weekly podcast, which is amazing. But think of those brands and companies where there's a sh shared mission, a shared message, and therefore they're going to be attracted to what you can give them. What can you provide them? And that's what you want to really lead with when you're pitching these companies. And so for me, it was starting with, hey, will you sponsor a couple episodes of my podcast? Made it super modest, made it a low hanging fruit offer that it was easy for them to say yes to. Not a huge commitment. I would do all the work. And then once I got my foot in the door with them, I just completely over delivered, built that relationship, gave them even more than what they asked for. And from then have just continued to build the relationship to the point where now I'm like a complete spokesperson for Fiverr. I speak at all of their conferences and different events. They did a Mother's Day campaign and they invited my mom to be part of it. Whenever they travel to my city, they come and they shoot content with me. When I had my podcast mastermind, they sponsored it and gave everybody fiber credit. So it started very small. It was like, can I have 250 bucks? And now it's priceless. I definitely recommend reaching out to companies, like you said, companies that will be relevant to your audience instead of like mattress ads or home delivery kits or whatever that might not be relevant and work out a deal directly with the company. Kind of like what you're saying. I think that's the best way to go about it. Create your own rules, which is a big part of my message, right? You decide what your worth is. If you are faced with some kind of setback, are you going to just say, well, I guess it won't happen for me? Or are you going to figure out a way to make that happen? And so when I pitched Fiverr, absolutely, I sold them much more on how my audience really trusts me, respects me. They see me as an authority in the space. They look to me for advice on how they can make money. I'm out there doing all of these other things not related to my podcast where I can always make that connection to what I'm talking about and what your platform is. I have all these different social media channels, not just my podcast. So I sold them on a bigger long-term vision and they got it right away. And a little bit of it was luck, but a lot of it was just being really creative and believing in the value that I, I know I provide to them. Yeah. So how long have you had your podcast? I started my podcast in 2017. So as soon as okay. I quit my job and pursued freelance. Podcasts were starting to become more and more popular and I was looking for something creative to do. I had been in sales for so long that I really wanted to create something. And I also 
needed to learn. I had no idea how to work online, work from anywhere. Back then, the only people doing it were like travel bloggers and travel influencers. I didn't know anyone in my life who I could reach out to and ask for advice. So I figured I'll start a podcast. I'll interview people who have the freedom lifestyle. I'll call the show the freedom lifestyle. And after a few episodes, maybe I'll have some ideas on my next step. Well, it turned out that this desire to be able to work from anywhere in the world and on your own terms, I wasn't the only one who felt it. And so the audience picked up quickly. Sponsors came in quickly and I just loved it. And so I haven't been producing an episode every week for the last like six years. I've done seasons. But right now I'm on a season and new episodes drop every Thursday. Oh, awesome. So you kind of started the podcast with the intention of not doing it long term, I guess, is what you're saying. Yeah. And I think that's helpful whenever we want to try something out or add something and you're not sure exactly how it's going to go time bound it. I have a lot Mm. of people that say to me like, oh, I'd like to be digital nomad. But what if this? What if this? What if that? Try it. Why don't you say for one month? I'm going to see what it's like to go live in this area and see what it's like to work there. You don't have to blow up your life completely. You can have different project-based ideas, test them, give yourself a chance to reflect on it. And if it's a fit and it felt good and it worked, double down. But there's so many things I tried that I just said, okay, well, this isn't working. Change this up or stop doing this. But at least I tried and you get so much clarity through action. And I think That's how I approach my podcast is this doesn't have to be a weekly show forever. I think I started with five episodes on season one and returned for season two after a six week break. Yeah, it's kind of funny because when I started my podcast, I guess that was 2019, it was only going to be like 10 episodes and it was going to be to promote my book that I had coming out called Frugalpreneur. It was just kind of an extra marketing avenue was my thought. But I got more leverage and traction with the podcast than the book and love the networking and connections and the feedback and all of that. So, yeah, almost five years later, still doing it. Amazing. Good for you. And smart thinking about it as a marketing channel, right? I really help entrepreneurs see that connection of what a podcast can do for your business and building your name and building your thought leadership and also having a channel that you own whenever you want to market something or get the message out. Great. I have a new program launching called Your Next 90 Days. I am so happy I have this podcast where I have this intimate following and listenership where I could tell them about the new things I'm doing and tell them who it's for and see if they're interested in. That is just something that I'm, it's like an asset that if you invest in, you can lean on it in so many different ways as your entrepreneurial journey brings you on the ride that it brings you on. Yeah, I I mean, it makes sense to for any kind of digital nomad or anyone who's working in freelance or or has some kind of remote job where they can travel and stuff. Why not have a podcast? Because it's a very easy thing to do when you're traveling because you don't need a whole lot to (laughs) to get the job done. So your podcast is Freedom Lifestyle and your website is whatsyourfree.com. I really appreciate your time today. I think people who are considering freelancing or the digital nomad or the freedom lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, I think this will give them some good ideas. And do you have any like last thoughts as far as maybe tips for someone who's thinking about this or just starting that process? I would say if you're feeling this dream and you're feeling this desire, it's coming to you for a reason. I know for some people, the whole universe message, all of that is wishy-washy, but there's a lot of like science back research now about when you see somebody who has a life that you want, maybe it triggers some envy, maybe it triggers some temptation. It's usually a sign that that's what you're meant to do and that's what's going to light you up. And so if you're getting these feelings, you're getting them for a reason how you actually get to it, the path is usually not totally clear. There's been so many times in my like leveling up and unlocking my next level that I had no idea how it was going to happen. But it starts with having the vision of what you want and just taking small steps every single day towards that, being flexible in your approach. When things are working and everything's scaling, honestly, it's kind of boring. Sometimes you can get bored of your business. You're like, all right, well, it's so predictable. There's something very fun about that experimental phase of I have no idea how this is going to happen or in what ways this is going to unfold. But I'm going to go on this exciting journey of trying to figure it out. Like, 
I think that keeps life interesting is is having this dream. And so that's my advice. I think that if you want to take the leap, whether it's adding a new revenue stream or growing an audience or going from part-time to full-time entrepreneur, you have two options. You can do it yourself, consume all the free content, all the free knowledge, listen to podcasts like this and just step-by-step do it. Or you can work with somebody who's done it before. And I call it like skip the line where you can take everything they've learned of all all of the years and get there a lot quicker. And so if anybody's feeling like they might want that next step and some help skipping the line, I would love to work with people. And I'm offering right now free clarity calls. So 20 minute calls, no obligation. We can chat about what you're thinking, what your dreams are. I'll give you some immediate feedback. And we'll decide whether you're a good fit for this new program I'm launching called Your Next 90 Days. Oh, awesome. Would people find that by just going to whatsyourfree.com? Yeah, whatsyourfree.com backslash next 90 days. You'll learn more about the concept of the program. It's all about let's focus now. Let's work hard. Let's make those trade-offs. Let's focus on a couple core goals. And then by the time summer comes, we're going to be so satisfied with what we accomplished. We can enjoy our summer. We can relax a bit because as you know, from this, from this conversation, they've always taken a life first approach. If you're going to have your own business, if you're going to be self-employed, you might as well do it so that you can enjoy your life. So that's a big part of the program. And you can book a call right from that page. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate you having me. You asked such great questions. Oh, thank you.